This Learn Loads mini lesson provides a basic overview of the law of negligence. It would be especially useful for students studying AQA A-Level Law Unit 2. This video is a good place to start understanding negligence, to see the wood from the trees if you like. What is negligence? In everyday language the term negligence means failure to take proper care. In legal terms, where this failure results in some kind of damage, the person who's caused it, the defendant, is liable to compensate the claimant for the damage suffered. This applies whether the claim is based on personal injury or damage to property. The modern law of negligence stems from Donoghue and Stevenson, 1932. Mrs Donoghue went to a cafe with a friend who bought her some ginger beer. The proprietor of the cafe opened the ginger beer and poured some of the contents out. The bottle was opaque so it was not possible to see inside it. When the glass was topped up, a partially decomposed snail came out of the bottle. As a consequence, Mrs Donoghue became quite ill. It's worth pointing out that it was the purchase of, if it was the purchaser of the ginger beer who'd been made ill, there would have been a right to claim for damages under the contracts of sale. But of course Mrs Donoghue had not purchased the bottle which left her without much hope at the time of successfully claiming against the cafe or the manufacturer of the beer. In this case, Lord Atkin created the principles of negligence law to give people like Mrs Donoghue a right of legal action. Negligence is part of the law of tort, which is one part of the civil law. Civil law is mainly concerned with settling disputes. Civil disputes may involve private individuals, businesses, or the government, so negligence cases are different from criminal cases, which focus on prosecution and punishment by the state for breach of the criminal law. Before going further, try this little activity. Pause the video and decide which three of the terms listed are used in civil law. Restart the video to see the answer. When does liability for negligence arise? Lord Atkin, in his landmark judgment in Donoghue, said that a manufacturer of products that could not be inspected before use owes a duty of care to all those who might be expected to consume their product, not just the purchaser. Lord Atkin set out his general test, now known as the neighbour test, to establish when a duty of care might arise in other sorts of cases. He said you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbour. By neighbour, he basically meant those you would reasonably be expected to have in mind. Over time, negligence claims have been recognised by the courts in a wide range of situations, not just in relation to manufactured goods. Negligence claims may result, for example, from a road accident, from injuries at work, from careless medical treatment, or even from work badly done by an accountant or a lawyer. For a claimant to prove liability and negligence, they must prove three things. Firstly, that a due to care was owed by the defendant to the claimant. Secondly, that this duty had in fact been breached. In other words, the defendant did something that was careless. Thirdly, that the breach caused damage. The loss suffered needs to have been caused by the defendant's carelessness rather than some other cause. I'll briefly outline each of these three elements of negligence. First of all then, duty of care. The duty of care idea is used by the courts to identify where a defendant should be seen as having an obligation to avoid causing damage to the claimant. In Caparo Industries and Dickman, a three-stage test was created to establish the existence of a duty of care. This test is the one still used today. It involves asking, was the damage to the claimant reasonably foreseeable? Was the relationship between the claimant and the defendant sufficiently proximate? And lastly, is it just and reasonable to impose a duty of care? Reasonably foreseeable here means 
asking whether a reasonable person would have predicted that the claimant might suffer injury or damage. Proximate, in the second part of the test, is a way of summarising Lord Atkin's neighbour concept. Lord Atkin said, persons who are so directly affected by my act, they ought reasonably to have them in contemplation. Proximity is about closeness. It means that there must be a relationship between the two parties that is sufficient to create a duty of care. One case that illustrates how the duty of care works is Watson and British Boxing Board of Control. The defendant, the British Boxing Board of Control, runs boxing. All those involved in a boxing match are obliged to comply with the board's rules. The claimant, Michael Watson, suffered a brain hemorrhage during a title fight. He received medical treatment, but only after a delay, by which time he had sustained serious brain damage. He claimed damages in negligence from the Board of Control. The Board argued that it owed no duty of care to the claimant, Watson. Lord Phillips of Worthmer Travers, ruling in favour of Mr Watson, said that the injuries sustained by professional boxers were clearly foreseeable. These injuries were a consequence of being in a boxing match, an activity that the board controlled. There was therefore a relationship of close proximity between the board and professional boxers. It was also fair, just and reasonable to impose a duty of care on the board. Secondly, breach of duty. Even if it's foreseeable that the claimant might suffer loss as a result of the defendant's negligence, was the defendant's behaviour actually careless? For example, any driver owes a duty of care to other road users, but has not, not breached that duty until driving below a certain standard. Damage caused by a defendant does not necessarily amount to a breach of duty, even though a duty of care is present. One illustration of this can be seen in Bolton and Stone. In that case, a cricket ball travelled out of a cricket ground into the adjoining but little used lane. This happened seven times in 30 years. Only on the seventh occasion did the ball hit a passerby after travelling 100 yards in total. There was a 17 foot high fence on the cricket ground boundary. The management of the cricket club, however, was sued in, sued in negligence for causing injury. Did the fact that a tall offence was not put in place amount to a breach of duty? The House of Lords held that the chances of this kind of accident occurring were so slight that the club could not be expected to take any more steps to guard against it. The cricket club owed those passing a duty of care but had taken reasonable steps to prevent harm. This idea of what is reasonable is central to deciding whether there has been a breach of duty. Thirdly, damage. If a claimant has established the existence of a duty of care and a breach of that duty has been shown, the claimant also needs to prove that the defendant was the cause of the damage suffered. Take the example of road traffic accidents. It might be straightforward to find witnesses to identify that it was the defendant's vehicle which collided with the claimant's vehicle. In other kinds of case though, the task of linking damage to breach of duty can be less clear cut. In, de in deciding if a defendant should be liable, the courts may be faced with one of two questions. If there are a number of possible causes of damage, a number of them, which should be treated as the significant one? This is the issue of what's called causation. Secondly, what are the limits of the defendant's liability for damage? This is the issue of what is known as remoteness of damage. An example of a case where, despite a breach of duty, the defendant was not held liable for the plaintiff's loss is Barnett and Chelsea and Kensington Hospital. The claimant's husband went to a hospital. He was suffering from what was only much later diagnosed as arsenic poisoning. The doctor on duty and casualty did not examine him. He was simply told to see his own GP. Several hours later, he died. His wife brought a claim in negligence against the hospital. In the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court, the judge ruled that defendant was not liable. 
even if the man had been examined and treated at the hospital, it was very unlikely that anything could have been done to save him. The effect of the poison was too far advanced at that time. The negligence of the doctor was not the cause of death. The hospital had breached their duty of care, but this was not the cause of the death. So, to sum up, negligence is part of the law of tort, which is one part of the civil law. The starting point for negligence is the neighbour test in Donoghue and Stevenson. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee will be likely to injure your neighbour. To prove liability in negligence, a claimant has to prove three things. Firstly, that a duty of care was owed by the defendant to the claimant. Secondly, that this duty had in fact been breached. Thirdly, that the breach caused damage. The loss suffered needs to have been caused by the defendant's carelessness. To find out more about LearnLoads resources for A-Level Business and A-Level Law, visit LearnLoads.com. Created using Powtoon.